will start us up and go ahead, Sherry. Okay, uh, Andrew is already with us. So I'm pleased to welcome Andrew Radzik from the Georgia Street Alliance to speak to us this evening. There are more than 175 environmental groups around BC and Andrew was referred to us as one of the most informed on the risks and realities of oil spills on the BC coast. So we're really pleased to have him. His background is that he has served on two of, the of our province's oil spill phase two technical working groups. He's been part of numerous successful initiatives to stop pri private power projects and also to stop uh, new coal mine development. And he's an effective advocate for good climate change policy at the provincial and municipal levels. Andrew has been in love with the BC coast since his first ferry ride as a child, so he tells me. So the onslaught of fossil fuel projects which threaten the Salish Sea is dear to his heart. There are many issues which threaten the marine environment of the Strait of Georgia. He will speak to a particular threat, and that is the risks and realities of oil spills on BC's coast. So please wave to our speaker, Andrew Radzik. Thank you, Sherry. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, Victoria, my, my screen, uh, sh screen sharing is disabled by the host. Oh, hold on one second. I hope I can live up to that great introduction. Go ahead now. All right, can everybody see that? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, I'm going to begin with uh, a land acknowledgement. I do want to acknowledge that I'm coming from the traditional territories of the Squamish and the Swahili's people. Uh, the land and waters here are their lands and they've stewarded them for millennia. Um, and this is very relevant to this presentation because of how much work both the Squamish and the Suela Tooth have done to advocate for better spill response um, for decades. Uh, they have, they've been strong political advocates, they've done excellent technical work, and I find uh, you know, constant sources of information and inspiration in, in the work that they do. Uh, the other coastal nations that find themselves in what we call BC uh, people like the Cowichan tribes, the Haida, the Helsinki Nation, and many others are also tireless advocates for this kind of work. And uh, I really believe that if we're going to improve our ability to respond to spills, it's going to be with uh, significant Indigenous leadership. So let's talk about uh, the risks of a spill. So when we talk about risk, we're talking about two dimensions. Uh, risk is where likelihood and consequence intersect. Um, when we assess the risk of a marine oil spill, we're asking how likely an accident is to happen and what the accident would do to the ecology, economy, and communities that we live in. So we'll start with likelihood. And the question we can ask here is how likely is a spill to happen on this coast? And when people are asking that, what they usually mean is how likely is a giant catastrophic spill to happen on this coast? Um, and this is an important question, uh, and we'll deal with it uh, at some length. But the answer to the question of how likely a spill is is much simpler. There's probably one happening right now. Um, Transport Canada's aerial surveillance program, for example, in 2018 detected 550. Uh, these are small spills. That's just on the Pacific coast, by the way, right? So that's, these are small spills. They're operational spills. Uh, fuel or engine oils or lubricants, four liters here, 25 liters there. Um, these are in the vicinity of marinas or ports, the consequences of a maritime economy, uh, fueling mishaps, engine leaks. Um, they're not the catastrophic nightmares. They're a slight sheening in, a, you know, in, in the waterways. Um, and so mostly they're ignored. Uh, they're not cleaned up. They're left to dissipate on their own. There's very little follow-up of those 550 spills in our region in 2018, only two were ticketed. Uh, we don't do the level of baseline data collection or environmental monitoring that we need to to understand the impacts of these spills. Um, but what we do know is that any amount of fossil fuel is toxic and it can kill wildlife it can destroy or degrade habitats, and it can contaminate critical resources in the food chain. But again, when, when people are asking about oil spills and the likelihood, they're asking about this, right? They're asking about tanker traffic. Um, and the likelihood of a large spill is a fiercely debated question. And there's an obvious reason why, right? The, the Trans Mountain Pipeline and the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Um, that pipeline would increase tanker traffic by anywhere from seven to 15 times down this route. Um, it depends on how you do the math, what year you pick as your baseline year. Uh, tanker trips have been fluctuating a lot over the last few years, especially, obviously, COVID has probably been uh, one of the weirder years for them. 
Much of the federal government's rationale for proceeding with the project rests on spills being low risk for the West Coast. Much of the opposition um, rests on a much higher perception of, of that risk. Now, I'm a partisan in this debate. Uh, Georgia Strait Alliance considers the risk of a spill too great, but I'm gonna try and paint as accurate of a picture as I can. Um, the issue has been involved, uh, has been examined from a lot of different angles and the differing opinions kind of concentrate around two uh, predictions. One belongs to Trans Mountain, and that's this one here. According to them, the risk of a marine spill from a tanker associated with the project is like one every 237 years, and a worst case spill will happen every 2,600 years. Um, that means it's a 16-ish percent chance of a, of a significant spill and, a less, and about a 1.1 percent chance of a of a worst case spill during the operating lifetime of the pipeline. The other view comes from studies done by the Suela Tooth, and that's these numbers here. These studies are use a number of different models for calculating the likelihood of a spill, uh, including models the US government uses to calculate spill risk, models used in Washington state to assess the risk of an accident between vessels and uh, so on and so forth. These are transparent peer reviewed models. They're very robust, they've been tried a number of times. Um, and they put the likelihood of a spill in the first 50 years of operations of the pi expanded pipeline between 58 and 98%. That last one obviously would mean it's almost certain that it would happen. And I lean towards this analysis. Uh, I think that they're robust models. I also think the Trans Mountains model has a number of issues with it. Uh, the, their model is opaque. Not all of their assumptions are clear. They didn't provide the raw data to allow for reproducing it. They weigh certain risks without sufficient documentation. It uses data sets that have specific underreporting flaws. You'll notice here though that this is a debate that can get quite technical and it's not very accessible. Um, and it also doesn't really matter because the federal regulator and the federal government has said they're right and the people who think the way I think are wrong. Um, they don't think a spill is likely. But even if we accept these, you know, the larger numbers here, the risk of a spill is still rare, right? We're still talking about, you know, maybe one in every 50 years. Uh, they're not an every day or every year occurrence. Large tanker spills are less common than they were in the 1970s and 80s and, and 90s. Um, as you can see by this chart, not only have li large tanker spills declined over time, the volume from them uh, for the most part has declined over time. Safety features like GPS and radar uh, requirements to have experienced pilots on board who know the, the area that a ship is traveling through, um, better tug capacity, have all contributed to lower the number and size of incidents. Uh, a big one is the addition of double hulled tankers. Used to be that there was just basically a single hull in a tanker. Now there are compartments of oil within those hulls. So if they, if they do strike something, less oil will leak out. Um, and it's absolutely fair to say the likelihood of a large tanker spill has declined over time. But then you get to 2018 and you can't ignore the size of that single incident. Uh, it orients us towards the other element of risk assessment, the potential consequences. Uh, the Sanchi incident was, is the ninth largest tanker spill in history, the largest of the past 20 years. It was the result of human error. Two ships collided near Shanghai. Um, the accident resulted in about 113,000 tons of condensate being released. Condensate's a particularly volatile liquid that gets extracted from natural gas wells. It off gases a lot of toxic fumes and that are liable to ignite and, and did. Um, so no response was really possible. They couldn't mobilize anyone to get out there. They, they got one rescue crew to get near there to try and rescue the, the sailors. And when the wind shifted and the toxic fumes started to blow their way, they had no choice to leave, but to leave because they would have died. As a consequence, all hands on board were lost. 32 sailors lost their lives. And that when they sank, an additional 2000 tons of fuel from the ship's tanks was released, um, which is a, it called bunker sea fuel. It's a very thick sort of tarry substance and it persists in the natural environment for a very long time. Uh, we still don't know what the full environmental impacts are of this and we may not ever know. Um, it's a bit of a weird incident because it began in Chinese territorial waters, but the ship actually drifted into the Japanese exclusive economic zone. Um, so who's studying what isn't really clear. These are not governments that have um, a huge amount of transparency on environmental issues. Um, that, again, it's a result of human error, a collision between two ships. And this is one factor that pops up over and over again in spills. Marine accidents in Canada tend to fluctuate in a pretty narrow bound. You can see that right there. Um, so one incident is always in play. Accidents involving human errors can never reduce to zero. And 
large spills are low probability, but high consequence events. So you really only need one to have something really, really terrible happen. Um, so that brings up the question of uh, what are the possible consequences of a large spill? What would happen to our coast? And so when it comes to the impacts of a large spill, we have a very well-documented example that happened uh, north of here in 1989. And that's the Exxon Valdez incident. Um, the Valdez is not a perfect analog for a tanker spill in BC, as spill responders like to say, every spill is different. Um, but the, you know, the Valdez, for example, it was a single hull tanker, not a double hull tanker. Um, in fact, tankers moved to double hulls because of the incident. It carried Alaska crude, which is an oil we know how it behaves in water. Whereas the diluted bitumen that would be carried down the pipeline would, we don't have as much uh, information. That's also a hotly debated point, but probably more technical than I'll go into here. Um, the spill resourcing is different um, and so on and so forth. But because it happened in such a pristine environment um, in an untouched part of the world, it very clearly drew out the impacts of a spill on coastal ecosystems, on coastal economies, and on their communities. Because of its spectacular nature, it was one of the first big cable news stories. Um, this, the Valdez spill created a great deal of attention, and that meant that there was a lot of scientific study that followed. The species involved are ones that we recognize here in BC, salmon, herring, seabirds, orca. And the technologies and techniques of oil spill response, they actually haven't changed much since 1989. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later, but boom, skimmers, these are still the things that you use to respond to spills. Um, and hopefully this one isn't one that we, you know, it shares with BC. Before it happened, state regulators called a large oil spills in Alaska's water highly unlikely. Um, and that meant that they were underprepared. So on March 24th, 1989, the oil tanker Exxon Valdez struck Bly Reef in Prince William Sound. The grounding of the Valdez happened just after midnight with the ship's third mate in charge. The ship had a state-of-the-art radar system, which was meant to prevent this type of incident, but it was turned off and it turned out that it wasn't actually in a very good repair. The third mate was sleep deprived and he was not professionally qualified to take the helm in these circumstances. The captain was asleep in his bunk. Rumor and legend has it that it was after a night of heavy drinking. So the incident had a huge spill response, um, unprecedented at the time. Boats and booms and skimmers were mobilized from all over. Pressure hoses for beach cleanup, soap for oiled seabirds, Thousands of mobile workers were mobilized. About 11,000 people ended up working on the spill. And over $2 billion was spent on the wages, equipment, and, and lodgings necessary for the, to clean up that spill. And as we know, the spill was not effective. Uh, spill response was not effective. Alaska was underprepared, as I mentioned. Um, because of the remote location, it took 10 hours to get booms to the spill area. And booms are what you use to contain a spreading spill. Um, and by then, it was too late. Quick response is the difference often between success and failure because oil spreads so quickly. Uh, two cups of oil released into water can spread into a one acre oil slick or about 4,000 square meter oil slick in an hour. And the Valdez spill spread incredibly rapidly. It was half a football field per second over two days. That's every second, it was, it, it was enormous. Uh, the Valdez ended up spilling about 37,000 tons or, or 42 million liters of oil into the uh, subarctic ecosystem. Uh, that meant that uh, 2,000 kilometers of coast was oiled, about 300 kilometers of which was heavily oiled. And the cleanup was 10 to 14%. So the overwhelming majority was left behind. The death toll of spe for species in the sound was enormous. Billions of salmon eggs, uh, 22 killer whales, over 2,000 sea otters, 300 harbor seals, and 250,000 seabirds died. Uh, seabirds are particularly susceptible to oil. Um, Oil compromises the ability of their feathers to trap heat. Um, a splotch the size of a quarter can kill them. So you can imagine what oiling to this level would do. Um, because they couldn't clean up the spill, massive amounts of chemical dispersants were used to, to break up the oil slicks. Uh, these dispersants turned out to be toxic in and of themselves. They were actually more toxic to seabirds than the oil that killed them in, those, in such large numbers. The spill caused responders to develop liver, kidney, and lung and nervous system disorders. So of those 11,000 spill responders, 3,000 of them developed some kind of an illness. Uh, and they used these pressure hoses to clean up the beaches. It turned out that that killed a whole bunch of bacteria that were incredibly necessary to rebuild the food chain and therefore actually ended up um, making the spill impact even worse. And the long-term impacts are still being felt 30 years later. Uh, oil is still on many beaches in Prince William Sound. This one is an image from 2018. Um, 
Studies in the year 2000, 2004, and 2009 indicated that the toxic compounds in the oils were still bioavailable. Fish embryos in particular were, were still susceptible to these um, toxic compounds. Harlequin ducks were showing exposures up until 2011. By about the 25 year mark in 2014, the toxicity had faded in most locations. A few deposits may still be poison in the wildlife, but most of the rest of them are, are not. Um, so we can put the toxic impacts of oil in the environment uh, in the 20 to 25 year range. In other words, the length of a human generation. But the population level impacts are still ongoing. Um, the longer term impact on species is, is partially visible in this chart. This was prepared for the 25th anniversary of the spill by the agency, the, 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 the trustee council that um, ran recovery in, in Prince William Sound. Um, the, you can see that some species recovered in the wake of the spill at various different timelines, um, but others are permanently diminished. In the case of the transient orca pod, um, it has been rendered functionally extinct. What that means is that the pod has survivors, they continue to travel the sound, but they can no longer breed. And this is a genetically distinct population that is nearing the end of its existence. Our lasting memory of them is going to be a skeleton in a museum because they're not gonna be there for very much longer. The impacts on the economy of the region were dramatic. You can see from this, you know when the spill happened. Uh, this is fishing um, revenues. And the fishing industry was one of the largest employers in the area. Uh, the fish, fishing industry workers were, were absolutely stretched thin. It, it created a, a wave of bankruptcies and, and people that were hanging on by the skin of their teeth in the region. Um, when the fishing revenues bounce back, when you see the fishing, fishing start up again, most of that is salmon fishing. Uh, and not herring fishing because that herring never recovered. What's important to note about that is that people who are local to the sound really relied on the herring fishery. It was worth about $8 million a year in the late eighties um, and it's gone. It has basically not returned. And this has led to an estimated $400 million loss for the fishers in the region. And the impact on tourism was similar. Revenue from sport and recreational fishing, which is a big driver of tourism uh, in Prince William Sound dropped by $580 million the next year. Alaska suffered immense reputational damage. No one wants to vacation in an environmental disaster. Um, and human recreation and tourism are still considered recovering from the spill. So the people who had the bad luck to live on a tanker route were hammered in the pocketbook. These economic losses were supposed to be compensated for by ExxonMobil and a lot of fishers especially were looking at this as a lifeline. Um, and so as is not unusual for oil spills, they went to court. So in 19... Uh, 94, 38,000 people were involved in the litigation and they won. They, a jury awarded them $287 million in compensation and $5 billion in punitive damages. Exxon appealed. They took it to the Ninth Circuit Court who cut the um, punitive award from 5 billion to 2.5 billion. They appealed that all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court cut that down further. It ended up being $507 million. In other words, a, a tenth of what the original award was. Uh, and later that year, Exxon agreed to pay 75% of that. So this kind of legal attrition um, is not unusual in oil spills. Just to put this in perspective, the total damage was 9.5 US billion dollars and Exxon paid out $3.4 billion in total for the spill. The rest of that is a bill that was footed by the taxpayers. So with the ecology uh, scarred, the economy hammered, social impacts were deeply felt. The economy, or the communities, excuse me, of Prince William Sound are very small and remote. The largest community in the Sound, Valdez, had a population of about 4,000 people in 1990. Um, the immediate impact of the spill had a dramatic impact on people's mental health. Uh, one year after the spill, researchers found that 20% of the people in the communities they were studying had uh, generalized anxiety disorder. 9.4% of them had PTSD. Longer term studies found a host of impacts. I won't even list them. I wouldn't even necessarily say you need to look at this with um, exhaustive detail. It's, it's, it can be actually overwhelming to look at. Uh, there were insufficient mental health and social resources to go around and communities experienced litigation, the ongoing litigation is a major source of stress. As the court case dragged on and the, you know, the impacts were being felt, people started to leave the region because they were looking for a better life elsewhere. Um, and those job losses were exacerbated by the fact that um, subsistence fishing, right? People going out and getting their protein from the land, 13,000 people in the region lost their ability to do that. And these impacts were even more pronounced in the indigenous communities, the, the really small tucked away communities um, in the sound. The cultural values of Alaskan indigenous communities are intimately linked to the seasonal harvest of salmon and clams, seals and other marine wildlife. 
these harvests provide protein for the community and cultural meaning. And these are not separate categories for these communities. Uh, spiritual themes, their conceptions of themselves, uh, traditional knowledge and seasonal, rit seasonal rituals linked their communities to their biophysical environment. The spill disrupted that connection. It was termed uh, a collective trauma. An indigenous leader says of the spill, uh, this is hurting more than anything else we've experienced. And when you think about the impacts of colonialism, that really draws out like how the spill you know, hit those communities. Uh, fumes were sickening people. These communities were overrun by spill response teams. It was likened to an invasion. Um, the impact on wildlife had a tremendous cultural resonance. Another indigenous uh, community member was quoted as saying, when you pick up these dead carcasses day after day, you go through a mourning process. It's not only the death in your environment, but in a sense, it's a death of yourself because you're part of that environment. Um, not surprisingly, the impact of the spill caused violence, drug and alcohol use, and social issues in these communities to spike. But there were even less social and mental health resources available for indigenous communities than there were the already insufficient amount available in the settler communities. Uh, 2,000 members of these communities lost their ability to subsistence fish. And US courts refused to even consider compensation for what they termed a quote, non-economic lifestyle choice. So for the next 15 years, indigenous communities avoided many traditional harvest areas over fears of contamination. And by the time the science indicated they were safe, a whole generation had not been taught the foraging and gathering and, and processing skills that you need to harvest effectively. Uh, this is a picture from the 1890s. Um, and this kind of stuff just wasn't done in, in those communities for a very long time. Um, so youth weren't learning subsistence skills, elders weren't engaged in teaching them, and this dislocated a cultural system that had endured for millennia. So when we talk about the consequences of the spill, it's this kind of dislocation of ecosystems, of economies, and of communities that are what we at GSA think of and what we're concerned about. And the Valdez is often held up as the great oil spill catastrophe, right? It's the biggest, the largest, and the worst. But this isn't actually correct. This is the 36th largest tanker spill. Um, it is the best studied one. It's the, probably the best studied environmental disaster. Um, and it illustrated that some ecosystems and species are, are far more sensitive to oil than others, that impacts can linger for more than 20 years, and that the people in an area are going to feel those impacts for a very long time. And because of its relative proximity, the cultural resonance, the fact we share many species, it stands as an important reminder of how and why spills can go wrong if they happen here in the Salish Sea. These are some of the areas that would be impacted by a likely spill here. Um, the Valdez incident is not what a worst case spill would look like in BC, but it does give us an idea of what the consequences of a large spill could be. So it's obvious here, right, that the spill response in this case, in the Exxon Valdez case, was a failure. So how effective is spill response now? Surely things must have improved. We've got these great boats, right, and all of this new equipment coming down the pipe. We're often told that Canada has world-class spill response. So what does that look like? How effective is spill response around the world? We want to get an idea of what the average is for cleanup. We're obviously looking to be above average, but it's a good place to start to ground our expectations. So I'm going to ask everybody here, how, how much oil do you think is recovered in the average spill? Take a moment and think about it, and I'll show you in a second. So we're going to rely here on an industry source. This is the International Tanker Owners Pollution Federation. Um, and what they say is that the average cleanup of a spill is 10 to 15%. The government of Canada is actually even more pessimistic. They say five to 15%. So anybody who had that number, that's, that's it. It turns out that the Exxon Valdez case, that, that 10 to 14% is not an outlier. That is the average of spill response. Not only is most oil left behind in the natural world, but again, the overwhelming amount of that oil is left behind. And as I mentioned earlier, the foundational technologies of spill response are still the same. We use booms to contain oil or to prevent oil from entering into specific areas. You run skimmers to take the oil off of the water. Um, you use fire to burn it when it's grouped up if, if you don't have a way to get skimmers there to, to skim it off the water. And you use chemical dispersants to break up large oil slicks and to try and contain oil or to try and deal with oil that isn't containable. Uh, and frankly, the last two have some pretty other significant environmental issues involved with them. Now, there have been no great technological leaps forward since 1989, um, and that's, that's why it's no surprise that rates look the same. There's no magic new technology that people have been deploying. But in the context of their expansion proposal, Trans Mountain, uh, 
have produced volumes of information that say if a spill happens, we're going to clean it up better than anyone has ever cleaned it up before, much better than average, right? Uh, they have a specific scenario that's likely a spill. It's a, a tanker losing power at a key moment. It'll run into a reef in the Gulf Islands, um, and they project the ability to recover over 64% of the oil spilled at this reef or Acne Reef, leaving only about 25% of uh, an oil spill that would end up on shore. They say that with better data, with more equipment, and with rational management, we can get four to six times better a cleanup uh, than the global average while using the same fundamental techniques that we always have. This report was written in 2013. So it is worth asking the question, how well have things worked since? So we have two incidents that happened, one in 2015 and one in 2016, that um, we can really draw out what spill response on this coast looks like. On April 8th, 2015, in English Bay in Vancouver, uh, somewhere around 4.45 p.m., boaters began to spot uh, a spill slick. The Coast Guard was notified by the public there was a spill, including thick balls of tar in the water, at about 4.48 p.m. So the weather was mostly clear, sunny with some clouds. The temperature was mild, something like 12 degrees at that time. Now, English Bay, on a clear day in spring, is one of the best case scenarios for a spill. Lots of eyes on the scene, no wind and wave uh, to hamper response. Um, within an hour of the largest concentration of spill resources in BC and various ports, with um, the spill base for our coastal spill responder, Western Canada Marine Response Corporation, being about 40 minutes away. This was a fuel, not a crude oil spill, so it was lighter and um, wouldn't be as likely to sink. So you'd expect rapid response and extremely effective cleanup. So how much would you expect to clean up in this case? Again, I'll ask you to think about it for a moment. What percentage of this do you think was cleaned up? So there was a lot of discussion in the early hours with, within the Coast Guard about the spill. It took a longer for them to um, notify WCMRC, probably, I think, than they would in retrospect. Um, WCMRC boats arrived around 9.30 p.m. and began skimming oil off the water. Uh, but the Marathasa kept leaking fuel. The Marathasa was the ship responsible for this. Um, and although they were equipped with infrared cameras to spot spills in the dark, spill responders couldn't identify the vessel as the sport, source of the leak for many more hours. It wasn't until 3.30 a.m. that they decided to containment boom it, and that boom wasn't in place until 5.30 a.m. So we've had many hours of spread at this point. The next day, people were finding tarry residue from the spill washing up on shorelines. A bunch of volunteers came down with buckets and shovels and started cleaning up the tarry residue. Um, the city of Vancouver mobilized a lot of resources to help with cleanup. They eventually ran up a bill of about $550,000 in costs for the spill. So in the days following the spill, it was declared a success. WCMRC says that they cleaned up 80% of the spill, right? So we've got world, we have victory, it's world-class spill response. But it turns out that that number was not correct. The Coast Guard pegged the cleanup at about 1,480 liters and Transport Canada said that 4,000 liters was spilled. So anybody who had 37% as their cleanup rate, well done. Um, mm -hmm. Worth underlining this, under optimal, under nearly ideal conditions for spill response, the best we could do is 37%. Now, I don't know how you define success, but generally we know, right? 37% is not a passing grade. We're asked to put our faith in a system that can't respond to spills effectively in nearly perfect conditions. And we also have an, an incident that happened on our coast that was not a um, perfect incident and was even less successful. And we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But again, we have a spill and we know that if we have a spill, we end up having a court case. And uh, the owners refused to acknowledge their responsibility for the spill, so the federal government took them to court. They charged them with uh, discharging a pollutant into the waters and with discharging a substance harmful to migratory birds. And a judge dismissed the charges. Um, they, he said that the, on the grounds that the spill could not have been foreseen by the ship and was an accident and not intentional incident. Now, we know that spills will happen. 550 happened in, in 2018 alone, right? Like this is on, on our coast. Spills are not unforeseeable. They are part of the cost of doing business for, for having a marine economy. The way this ruling is interpreted by future courts is vital because this could be a precedent that dramatically limits or exempts polluters from paying for the pollution that they cost. And if they don't pay, those spills are going to be borne by the taxpayer. That $500,000 of extra cost that Vancouver rang up, are, they are still trying to get compensation for that. It's, that, uh, it's ongoing to this day. The Ship Source Oil Pollution Fund, the Canadian fund that pays for pollution when ships won't, um, offered them 27% of that, of their bill. Um, oh, okay. Otherwise, I guess we're just supposed to eat that cost. So the other high profile spill incident is the Nathan E. Stewart. 
And uh, that happened uh, in, in this area, or near Bella Bella, on October 13, 2016. Uh, the Nathan E. Stewart was an articulated tug barge, um, and it was in Helsuk Nation waters. Uh, the second mate was at the helm, and there was a number of course changes coming up in their navigation plan. And the second mate missed a key course change. Um, it would subsequently be discovered that he, was, he had fallen asleep. Apparently, there was soft music playing in the background, and the lights had been dimmed. Um, it also turned out that ships that travel in that area are required to have an experienced local pilot on board. But the Nathan E. Stewart had a waiver uh, because of the experience of the captain. Um, but the captain wasn't at the helm. It was the, uh, someone who was actually unqualified under that um, regulatory system. The ship had something called an ECS, an electronic chart system, that was supposed to um, set off an alarm if the ship veered off course, but it had been turned off. Something it turned out an investigation would reveal happened very regularly on that ship. So at 1 a.m., the ship ran aground on Edge Reef. Um, the Nathan E. Stewart began to take on water, and multiple holes were put in the bottom of the vessel. It partially sank and began releasing fuel and engine oils. In the end, it would release about 110,000 liters of diesel and 2,200 liters of engine oil and lubricant. So like the Exxon Valdez incident, we have a remote part of the world, a tired sailor not qualified to be at the helm, and safety equipment turned off. And like the Valdez, spill response in the incident was slow off the mark and highly ineffective. Um, so response was slow because most of the oil spill response resources in the region were in Prince Rupert, which is a very long boat ride away, about five hours. Um, so while the vessel was leaking fuel overnight and through the morning, no booms were put in place. Uh, the only reason that the booms were put in place was because Health Sick Nation mariners made multiple requests. First, they asked for someone to deploy booms, and then they just asked for the booms themselves and said, look, we'll set it up. Uh, but boom setup didn't begin until noon, and the mariners were not given much training and limited instructions on how to set them up. There wasn't enough boom to cover the mouth of nearby Gale Creek, which is an important cultural and harvesting area for the health suck. It also wasn't up to the conditions that it was deployed in. The currents from Gale Creek broke the boom. Where, where it connects, it snapped it in half. And you can see, this is a later image, but you can see where the booms were broken there. So it wasn't until 6 p.m. that evening that a vessel showed up that had boom strong enough um, to be able to have a chance of withstanding these kinds of coastal conditions. But by 7 p.m. it was dark and too dark to operate. And so the vessels had to stand down. So over the next few weeks, containment and cleanup efforts were hampered by, and frequently overwhelmed, frankly, by wind, wave, and currents in the area. The booms broke apart several times. Over the 40 days of the response, 11 saw operations suspended because of the weather. So as a result, um, almost nothing was cleaned up. They cleaned up about 1,400 liters. Um, but much of that was oily water and waste. Now, if that was all fuel, that'd be about 1.25% cleanup rate. Um, but the estimates for the volume of sorbents and, in, and water intake, and it wasn't disclosed. So it's some number less than 1.25%. Now, the consequences were not as dramatic as in the case of the Valdez. It was a smaller spill of a less persistent oil. But important harvesting areas were fouled, areas that um, provided black cod, clams, crab, halibut, kelp, rock cod, and a number of species of salmon uh, for the local community. The area impacted provided protein for the community, but also had an ancient village site of cultural significance, and it provided economic opportunity um, for harvests. They were actually three weeks away from opening the clam season in the area. Um, the area is still considered contaminated. Um, the lack of harvest is a problem in a rural community that has a single grocery store, and it obviously had, um, had a tremendous impact on the, the health of sense of self and, and, and that cultural um, and, and social matrix there, right? Uh, and the spiritual dimension. So we know what happens now, right? When we have an oil spill, what happens in, inevitably afterwards? We have a court case. The health sec had to take the Kirby Corporation, the operators of the Nathan E. Stewart to court um, in a civil claim in 2018. They did this because Canadian law doesn't allow compensation for seafood harvesting or cultural losses. So that means that some of the largest impacts on indigenous communities are not part of the polluter pays regime. Uh, further, the polluter does not have to pay for an impact assessment of the environmental damages of a spill. And the health not, had already paid for one and they wanted to do future ones, you know, to be able to see what the long-term damage was. So we have a system that we describe as polluter pays, but what the polluter pays for is quite limited. And the timelines as we saw in the, in the Maritasa case are, are very long. The federal government has promised to review and, and change the way that the system is structured. And the province of BC has said it will examine how to quantify loss of use and, and cultural damages and regulate polluters to pay for it. But as bureaucrats say, these initiatives are still ongoing, which we can translate as the system is still broken. So looking at these two events, 
I find it difficult to take the invocation of, of world-class spill response seriously. Um, the 64% that Trans Mountain claims will clean up from a worst case spill looks like a fantasy when you consider these events. If we can't handle these relatively small spills, it is beyond me to think why anyone think we'll do better when it's a thicker taria substance in, in enormous quantities. If we can't clean up more than 37% in ideal conditions, how are we going to do 64% in, you know, under conditions where things aren't that easy? So how can we improve it? So we could do this. This is these are the elements of a world-class marine spill prevention and response system. Um, an itemized list is obviously pretty long. And even this is just an overview. Um, the polluter pay system needs work. We've talked about that. We need more mandatory pilotage requirements. Any kind of regulation for shoreline cleanup would be a huge improvement because right now, if oil hits a shoreline, we really don't know how it's going to get cleaned up. There are almost no requirements. But I'm going to focus on one fundamental feature, and that's who's overseeing these fossil fuel transits. Right now, marine spill oversight is almost entirely federal. There's a sprinkling of provincial regulations, and that's deeply problematic. Uh, bureaucrats and politicians headquartered in Ottawa obviously don't have the same understanding of this coast as the people who live here do. Um, there's an element of complacency because large tanker spills are infrequent. Uh, the US government actually identified that kind of complacency as one of the core reasons that Alaska was not so unprepared for the Exxon Valdez disaster. There's the federal perception of the oil industry being a big driver of revenue and you know, deserving of a light touch of regulation. Uh, but I'm gonna quickly note here, benefits from this industry have been declining now for a very long time, as this chart indicates. Uh, government revenue and jobs have dropped significantly even as oil production is still rising. The federal government is also heavily lobbied by the oil and gas industry. Between 2011 and 2018, the government of Canada was lobbied 11,452 times by oil industry lobbyists. Uh, that's about six times a day. One of the persistent themes that regulation was always too much, right? They were fighting against legislation that, like the changes to the Environmental Assessment Act that might increase regulation for their projects. Um, obviously, increasing regulations on oil transit is, isn't even going to be a, a major priority in this conversation. And now with the purchase of Trans Mountain by the government, we have another different sort of arrangement. Uh, it used to be light touch, but now we have an owner of a major industry asset regulating itself. This is literally the fox garden in the hen house. Yes. So I thought about that. What we need is um, community oversight. In the wake of the Exxon Valdez, the American government put forward what they called a moral imperative in the preamble of the legislation governing oil movement. And it's this, right? Um, those with the most to lose from oil pollution must have a voice in decisions that put their livelihood and communities at risk. I think that's a core principle that we need to adopt. This is the kind of oversight we need on our coast. Um, in the wake of the Exxon Valdez disaster, the US government created two RCACs or Regional Citizens Advisory Councils. Um, political will was mobilized to do something about oil spills. And that recognition was government had not done their job. They'd been lax. Oil companies had been allowed too much leeway. So these organizations were enshrined in legislation, giving them a lot of legal weight. And they were charged to improve marine transportation and oil facility operations. These are some of the things that they must do. These are legal requirements. Their members include representatives from local and indigenous governments, commercial fishing industry, uh, recreational groups, environmental NGOs, the tourism industry. Um, and what's notable by its absence there is the oil industry is not part of this. Uh, it, it, that guarantees these things their, their independence. But they, they have a very codified relationship with the oil industry. They have a contract with them. The RCACs um, have a contract that says that for as long as the oil flows, it's their job to monitor the terminal and tanker operations. This gives them a pretty significant operating budget that comes from the oil companies. But the oil industry is, while they're paying for it, they're not directing the work. And the members are not experts, they're regular people. And so they bring a different set of values to the fore. Uh, they do a lot of outreach to the public. They have high expert, highly expert technical staff and advisors that they work with. And they deliberate and make their recommendations transparently. The work is meaningful, it's focused, it's well-funded, and it has that moral weight. And it's resulted in some incredibly positive impacts of spill response. Um, earlier, I mentioned the whole thing about double hull tankers. That's a standard that the US government brought in and it then became a, an international standard. That came as a consequence of a recommendation from these RCACs. They've helped to set world leading um, standards on spill response, resulting in some of the best technical manuals on how to respond to spills, a robust 
uh, network of these things, geographic response strategies for almost every single sensitive area and feature along the Alaskan coast. Uh, they've set up high standards for drilling and training for spill response and, and so many more things. I could, it is a laundry list of them. Um, now there has been a pilot project for an RCAC here in Burrard Inlet, uh, here on BC's coast, involving the Suela Tooth, the seven municipalities surrounding the inlet and GSA, where we're one of the groups um, and working together on it. But we've been unsuccessful in getting senior levels of government interested. Uh, it turns out that giving power to local communities is not high on their to-do list. But there's also another model for it here in BC. Um, and if you want community oversight on spill response, do that spill response yourself. So the Health Suck Nation put together this proposal for an Indigenous Marine Response Center, um, where they would run it, um, building on the marine and maritime traditions of their people. They decided to put together a powerhouse team of experts to put together this proposal and look at what, what does real world-class spill response look like? That image I showed earlier, that laundry list of the things that would make up spill response, they were like, how do we actually do those things? So they had engineers, tug and barge operators, data analysts, spill responders, vessel designers, and shipbuilders were all involved in, in this proposal. They proposed a very different model of spill response, something that looks more like how fire departments work than how oil spill response now, with oil responders on um, in spill response barges beside rapid response vehicles that would act sort of like a fire truck. They would get out and they'd get out quickly. Uh, they'd be ready to go immediately. They would use um, and, 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 and they have people trained in depth, not only who work for it, but also in these local communities. They would also use state-of-the-art vessel tracking data to prepare for when there are risky transits coming up. And they'd have a lot of eyes on the coast. So they're trying not to just be reactive to spills, but be proactive. Um, and they found that booms and other key pieces of equipment are frequently overwhelmed in the conditions along BC's coast. And so they proposed a significant budget for research and development into better equipment. And they proposed to build on some of those planning concepts that they use in Alaska. Um, it, it's an incredibly thorough proposal with a host of good ideas in it. It would also be significantly more expensive than spill responses now. It would, it would go into the hundreds of millions of dollars you know, over a 10 year period. Um, and unsurprisingly, the federal government didn't really engage with their proposal. They're not, they're not looking at taking these ideas in and into the way that I frankly think that they should be. So the, the work of these Alaskan RCACs and the HELSIC proposal point to what more effective oil spill response could look like. I don't, I don't wanna use the term world-class or world-leading because those terms are, are, are basically just rhetoric. They won't cut the risk to this coast to zero, right? But it will be a dramatic improvement over the status quo. Now all we need is the political will to adopt them. Um, but it took the Axon Valdez incident to get community oversight in Alaska. And, and my hope is that we don't need a catastrophe here to get the same, but my fear is that we will. And it's important to note something here. We're in the last mile of fossil fuel transits. Climate scientists are clear, we need to phase out fossil fuels by 2050 to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Uh, climate policy is slowly turning in this direction and we will probably see the last hangar transit in BC sometime in our lifetimes. Um, I hope that we don't suffer the cruel historical irony of a spill in the last days of the fossil fuel era. Uh, right now that's on the table and it doesn't have to be. Um, and there's far too much at stake for that to happen. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm ready to take them. I've muted everybody. So if you have any questions, if you want to put them in the chat or if you want to raise your hand and indicate that you would like to be unmuted or you should have the ability to unmute yourself. Andrew? Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, the fact that we are coming to the end of the fossil fuel era is the reason why there's so little interest on the part of the governments in funding these kinds of, of uh, endeavors? I don't think our governments are convinced that they are coming to the end of, near the end of the fossil fuel era. Um, you know, we've just seen the, the, the government of Canada bought the Trans Mountain Pipeline. It, it has an operating life of 50 years. Right, if they build the expansion. So they, they think it is a, another 50 years to go. Um, climate science doesn't think so. And there are other parts of the federal government that would say, no, 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 we're gonna be phasing this stuff out. But um, I think that, you know, it, there's a lot of brains in, in government. Many of them are not convinced that fossil fuels are, are, are coming to an end. I'd also say that here in BC, right, where we're you know, putting billions of dollars into um, the liquid natural gas plants and, uh, and fracking in, in BC's North, we're also not convinced that uh, the fossil fuel era is ending. Um, I don't think that that necessarily has anything to do with it. 
I think it's far more about the impact that it would have on the bottom line. Someone's got to fund it. It's, we're supposed to have a polluter pays regime. So it's supposed to come from um, the oil industry and the oil industry, like they lobby a lot. They don't like, they, they don't want to see that happen. Barry, did you want uh, to ask a question? Go ahead. Hey, hi. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm understanding that um, the bridges uh, in the Broad Inlet, uh, there might be a problem with the ships, the tanker ships, one a day leaving there, that, that it's kind of tricky in terms of the tides. Can you expand on that, or is that a problem? I mean, it limits the amount they can go in and out because of the, the depth of the channel. Um, they can only go when the water is quite low. Um, so yeah, it is about one a day. Um, it's worth noting that that there's a, a rail bridge there where um, I think it was in 1977, a ship actually crashed into that rail bridge, knocked it off its, its um, foundation. So, um, you know, that br the bridges could um, definitely be a navigational hazard. Um, the area near the terminal, terminals are always areas for spills. So the area, a lot of that is, you know, you're, you're plugging stuff into other things and oil may be running when you're not expecting it. So like that whole front end in Burrard Inlet is, is obviously an area of concern. Um, so that's a navigational hazard that they have to be very, very careful around. Um, but it's just one of many, right? Um, and I will say there will be experienced pilots on board in that time and maritime pilots are extremely good at their jobs. Um, my bigger worry is not so much the, you know, the, the people piloting the ship itself as, as other things happening. For example, the likeliest scenario is that a tanker loses power and crashes into Arachne Reef. So there's a maintenance issue there, right? Or, um, you know, like what happened with the Sanchi where another ship collided with it. So um, it's not that it, there isn't a navigational risk from bridges, there always is, right? Anything is a navigational risk that you can crash into. Um, but it's the human error pieces that involve multiple humans where, you know, things are always more um, dangerous. Hi. Thanks for your presentation, Andrew. It was um, very interesting. Um, my thing is getting baseline studies done, you know, the environmental uh, work that might, needs to be done along the coastline just to assess, you know, what cumulative impacts are there, what, you know, what areas are identified as being particularly stressed and also factoring in climate change into that. So that's all really expensive. Um, but I, I think it's important to steer the government in that direction, um, you know, with some pressure so that we know what we're working with when spills happen. You know, you can say, well, this is what we've got. This is how it's being affected. Um, so do you have any ideas of how, how that can be approached? Yeah, I mean, there's two angles to it. So I'll start with um, one that right now the province of British Columbia is uh, reassessing Trans Mountains um, environmental conditions for their certificate. Um, it's a very narrow reconsideration because of the way that a couple of interlocking court cases happened. Uh, one of the things that we've advocated for is um, that kind of baseline work, shoreline work. Um, BC can't ask for marine stuff that's like on water because that's federal jurisdiction, but a shoreline is, is in BC's jurisdiction. And they, uh, they, they put out their draft recommendations and there's th nothing to that. They, they say, well, the feds are doing it so we don't have to, um, which I think is uh, really problematic. If you go to our website, you can, uh, there's a tool there that you can sort of send a message to them saying, hey, we're, we're watching you on this and some points to consider to uh, put in a submission into that process. So I think it is vital obviously for this to be done. Um, the Swale Tooth are doing a lot of that work and the Squamish should be gonna do that as well in Broad Inlet. Uh, I know another, uh, a few other nations are also starting to look at that as well. Um, most indigenous nations would love to do more of that, quite frankly, they're just under-resourced for it. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I think that um, spill response is gonna take indigenous leadership because they take the stewarding of the, their land and waters, um, frankly, more seriously than a lot of our, our political leaders do. Um, that said, there are people that are, are pushing for this in various different levels of government. So I would say, you know, we've got this, this window right now where we need to push for it. Um, but, you know, there's constant advocacy for this in everything from environmental assessments of projects that might impact these areas to, you know, general sort of information reports that are being generated by scientists and pushed by various different environmental groups um, to government decision makers and to senior bureaucrats. And I think it's important to know that um, 
that pressure is it, it it's like the water eroding, you know, a rock over time, right? Like it, it's starting to work, but we're in a race right now with all of the different sort of impacts that we're, we're talking about. The climate crisis is obviously a huge issue and we're gonna be feeling the impacts from that. But, you know, as a friend of mine likes to say, the climate crisis is one element of actually a larger crisis and that's a waste assimilation crisis, right? Where we don't know how to, you know, the, the, the atmosphere is struggling with assimilating with this waste product, carbon dioxide, but we have wastes in every ecosystem that they're struggling to um, assimilate and we're overwhelming them. So, you know, we are in this race against time where people are starting to come around to like, we do need to do this kind of baseline work and baseline science is important. Um, but, you know, in, for some of these ecosystems, they're, we, we're really not sure how much degradation they can take any, any longer. Um, so yeah, take that opportunity now, I would say. Um, and I, I would also say that groups um, like, you know, Drift Strait Alliance, Raincoast, all the other groups that work on these kinds of issues, you know, get involved with them. Um, because, you know, we need the help. There's only so many of us to go around, right? And we need to have, to get government to really jump on this stuff, you need tens of thousands of people that are, are, are pressuring them so that they know that we're watching. And, you know, not to be too crass, but so that they know that their voters are watching. No, no. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I sneak one more in? <laughs> Sure, go ahead, Sherry. Um, this uh, West Coast Marine Response, is it now 100% Canadian owned? Because I had heard that at one time it was 50% um, owned by Kinder Morgan. I don't, I'm not really clear on the ownership structure right now. I'm not sure who's on the board of directors. Um, so I'd have to look. I do know that um, a lot of the staff, the senior staff at Trans Mountain, are the same now as they were under Kinder Morgan. They, they basically like stayed in their positions. I'm not sure if that extends to the board of WCMRC where they have uh, positions. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to double check that. So I'm not 100% sure. Um, I, will, I will say though that it, in some ways it doesn't really matter if it's Canadian owned or not Canadian owned. I think that um, because it is an, an industry owned spill response organization, um, the spill responders themselves, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to, besmirch them and say that they don't care about this stuff. You know, I think you don't go into that kind of work if you don't, um, if you don't care, but questions of resourcing and those larger sort of um, questions that come from the top down. I mean, oil companies are not, they haven't been the best environmental citizens over the years, whether that's in Canada or anywhere around the world. So, you know, it, I don't care if it's a Canadian owned oil corporation or, uh, you know, owned by, you know, Americans or, or the Dutch. We've seen accidents happen time and time again. And um, you know the level of concern just isn't there in that industry. It's, it, 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 there really is, my perception of them is an industry where um, you know, they, they're, they're trying to squeeze out as, uh, every dollar and so you know, safety becomes a secondary or tertiary concern. Thank you. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Okay, am, am I? Uh, you're here, let me, do you wanna? You're not on your camera, but if you want to go ahead. Bad for the environment, but we've studied and studied and we've studied it. Um, has the amount, has the same amount of energy ever gone in to the amount of raw sewage that has been pouring into the oceans for centuries? Um, like for the acidification level, because we know the acidification level is destroying the fish and uh, all of those kind of things. Like I, I sometimes I, I'm from the prairies, so I, I do know where you can't go off fossil fuels on a dime because people will freeze to death. It's minus 40 there today. Um, and uh, so I like, as a Canadian, I think we have to find balance and I often, um, I know the oil fields have been aggressive, et cetera, et cetera. But also, we've also dumped, I'm not sure if Victoria is still dumping raw sewage into the ocean. Have we ever figured out, spent some time studying those things? So uh, I am uniquely qualified to talk about this because I work for the Georgia Strait Alliance, who's been advocating for sewage treatment in Victoria for a long time. Sewage treatment is now in place in Victoria. We do, there is Good. a treatment plant. Um, the, for those who've been around for a while, they may remember Mr. Hankey, the giant walking poop, who used to draw attention to this issue for a very long time. Um, yeah, we've been working on that issue for an extremely long time. 
there the volume of sewage would not the, the amount of damage it does is infinitesimal compared to what a large spill could do. Um, and I appreciate that it takes time to um, transition an economy and people's day-to-day -day lives away from fossil fuels. That's why we have to begin now, and we're not. The, the idea that, you know, well, we can't turn on a dime is absolutely true, but we're not talking about turning on a dime. I, I have been in the environmental movement for 20 years. I, on and off, I've, I've done other things in my life. Uh, 20 years ago, I remember talking with a um, elected official about this kind of a transition. And, and you know, they weren't taking it seriously 20 years ago. Um, no, even I, 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 I quite agree with you on that one. I totally agree with you that the fossil fuels has had a tremendous amount of lobbying power and a lot of money. Um, and we do need to be getting off of it. But at the same time, like we have to find a fuel source to heat homes that doesn't give off any more, you know, as much. Natural gas is pretty low of a, an emitter compared to lots of things. I mean, compared to something like oil, sure. Uh, but I mean, you know, we, we generate a lot of very clean electricity in British Columbia. We should be deploying it more for that kind of stuff. I mean, my, my home is heated by electricity. I know that's not an option for everyone. Ground source and air source heat pumps are options. There's a number of different technologies that can be deployed. The, really what we need are governments that are willing to do the hard work of that transition. And there's two parts of that transition, right? One is we do need to build the infrastructure and the systems that allow for these, um, you know, heating and, and you know, power issues to be taken care of. But we also need to stop expanding fossil fuels. Um, we- I, I'm, not, I, I'm, not dis, I'm not disputing that at all. I, I hear you. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is that our, our governments dispute that. They're still expanding fossil fuels. They're not saying, you know, they're not talking about phasing them out. They're talking about, you know, we'll expand them, but, but slower. Um, and that's simply not tenable, right? Like. It, it's, you know, that we've heard a lot about, you know, the idea of balancing the economy and the environment. I'm still waiting for the environment part to get balanced because it's not happening. And, you know, we need to be aware of that. And I understand that there is a, you know, this is going to have a dramatic impact on how people live their day-to-day -day lives. And, you know, we do need to address that. And, and, you know, this is, this is frequently talked about in economic terms and in jobs terms. We need a just transition strategy, but that transition out of fossil fuels in terms of jobs, that's already happening. They're shedding tons of jobs in the oil patch and there's no plan for it right now. Those, you know, people are basically being thrown out of work and they don't know what to do. Um, if governments were, you know, serious about their commitment to jobs in that industry, they'd also be thinking about the workers that are losing their jobs as a natural consequence of, of you know, technological uh, advancement, meaning that there's a lot more automation in the oil field and as a consequence of oil demand starting to plateau because of climate policy. Um, it's, it, you know, it's time to take that kind of stuff seriously. And the, the reality is our governments don't. Um, you know, they're getting closer and closer to that point, but it's, it really is like pulling teeth and it's incredibly disappointing. Um, so I hear you and I don't disagree with you. And I think that there's actually a lot more common ground on this than it, that is sort of um, traditionally sort of structured in the, it's the economy versus environment debate in the media. Um, but we do have to, you know, be really clear on this. If, we're, if we want to follow the science, it says we need a, a phase out. And if we want to be, you know, fair to people, we need a just phase out, an orderly phase out, one that's planned and thoughtful and doesn't just have negative impacts on the communities that are, are very resource dependent. In BC, we saw what happened in the 90s and, and 2000s as, as logging basically transitioned out of employing people, right? It went from being a very large employer to a lot of automation. And, you know, it devastated a lot of those communities. That's going to happen in the oil patch right now because the battle that's being fought is a completely different one. It's not the battle that, that should be fought, which is, all right, this is happening we need an orderly transition. What kind of hazard, uh, to change the subject a little bit, does coal present in terms of marine transportation? Um, that would depend on a whole bunch of, uh, of different things. It doesn't, definitely doesn't release as much um, toxic material. It doesn't spread as much. It's a, it's a lumpy, chunky thing. Um, I, off, the, off the top of my head, I can't think of any coal spills that were um, of the level of devastation of, uh, of an equivalent size of, of oil. Um, I'd have to look it up more though to, to tell you more than that. Um, for me, my, my primary way of, of, of thinking about coal as a threat is of course as a climate risk. And also as, actually as, the, as a toxic uh, substance, right? When, it's, when it, can, it can definitely, you know, have caused a lot of sort of human health impacts, mm -hmm. dust and whatnot. But um, yeah, as, as far as a spill goes, I'm not really sure if it's marine impacts to the degree that I'd bother other impacts.
So thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'd like, is there, is there one more question? Yeah, I have a question, Val, it's Bonnie. Um, I'm a creature of the Great Lakes. Um, and I wondered what degree of study is going on about the um, spills and recent spills in the Great Lakes. Much smaller volumes of water, much more heavily populated um, areas immediately adjacent to any spills. Um, could you make a couple of comments or perhaps suggest a source I could go take a look at? Yeah, I actually wouldn't know off the top of my head. And that Fair I enough. It's a shame because I am also a creature of the Great Lakes. I was born in <laughs> And I grew up in Thunder Bay, so more than oh. one. Um, I will say that um, anytime that you have a fuel release into the water or any kind of fossil fuel release into water, um, you're going to have off-gassing of, of toxic fumes to a greater or lesser extent. So there's obviously going to be some kind of health impacts. Um, I don't know. I, you know. I'm aware that there have been some incidents, but I'm not really super aware of the sort of um, outlines of them. So I couldn't tell you there. I, okay. I don't know where to start, but I, I don't know. I guess Ontario Nature may be a place to yeah. start. Yeah, okay. Thanks for that, I appreciate it. No problem. So thank you again, Andrew, and I am sure that a lot of our members and, and people who, who didn't get to hear your talk will be, will be very interested in uh, looking at it on our, our YouTube channel. So uh, you'll be a star on our YouTube channel, just so that you know. And uh, thank you very much again. And if you would like to um, send Sherry some uh, perhaps uh, web addresses of where we could look up some of these people, especially the, the groups that you suggested we should join and advocate for. Uh, we'd be happy to put it in our newsletter. Wonderful. But thank you very much again. Thank you so much. You've been a, a great audience and I hope I wasn't too boring. No, thank oh, you. Very interesting. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good evening.